So as I said, the good news is um, that science is helping to take care of, of a lot of this, and um, some really smart people issued a report, the National Academy of Sciences issued a report about two years ago that said, science is great, but a lot of this stuff that they're using is not science. So all you defense attorneys out there and all you judges, your duty is to make yourself familiar. If the prosecutors want to use a certain piece of evidence, you better go and learn about it. You better get your own experts. You better read up on it because some of it's no good. Some of it's junk, what we call junk science. <clears throat> so that has challenged lawyers and, uh, and the system, law, judges included, to um, really look at this stuff closely at, while at the same time DNA continues to, uh, to put guilty people in prison and to exonerate innocent people, which is a good thing. Yes, sir. Do you think the death penalty actually prevents murders? Does the death penalty prevent murders? No, I, I, I don't believe it does, no. I think that the deterrence um, studies show otherwise. And I'll just tell you this, having dealt with people on, on uh, deterrence is a very logical thought process. And it's a very um, methodical thought process. If I do this, then they are going to do this, and I don't want that to happen. I can tell you very um, truthfully and consistently, my clients are not very logical. Over, uh, my clients that I met on death row were not, they just didn't have that capacity to think in that fashion. So deterrence for my clients, no. Also, a large percentage of the people that are on death row mm -hmm. for murder mm -hmm. were actually crimes of passion. Sure, absolutely. Instant crimes Where it there. happens like this. Yeah. And those people, <laughs> yeah. there's no way that's going to be deterred. Right, no, of course because not. Because they aren't thinking. Right. And there, there may be a case now and then where a person says, uh, you know, implies that kind of that logical thought process. But again, you know, it's, it's a it's a balancing you know, situation. Do we want to, you know, apply deterrence when all the studies um, that I'm aware of show that it doesn't work? Do we want to take that risk that maybe it does work in favor of convicting innocent people? Uh, of course not. Yes, ma'am. This is more a science question about DNA. Okay, I'm a lawyer, so be careful. <laughs> I know. So, so I don't, it may not be appropriate, but, but, did we have to have like the Human Genome Project, um, uh, done and completed where we could actually, you know, uh, track it? We knew what it was, for then to use DNA evidence. Is that? No. Is that two different things? No, it's two, it's two different things. Okay. Uh, what the effect of the Human Genome Project will ultimately be on DNA evidence is a great question, I, and I, I hope to learn that because I don't know exactly what that is. I mean, I've read about it, and I know what, what, it, what it is, but how it will affect DNA as it's used in forensic evidence in criminal cases, I don't, I don't know yet. So, but good question. Mm -hmm. To me, one of the more amazing <coughs> things about logic is that uh, about does the death penalty prevent people from killing is just to look at Texas and has the massive use of, of the death penalty. Yeah. So, you know, there are no murders in Texas anymore. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, good point. Yeah. Very, very good point. Yes, ma'am. I wonder, do you have, a, as a defense attorney, what's your opinion about the Department of Corrections starting DNA on all inmates? Oh boy, um, you know, it's a very slippery slope. Um, it's a it, because you know if you if somebody had said that ten years ago, I would have said, oh, no, it's not. They're just going to take it in sexual assault cases in case there are other unsolved. Se and look where it's gone. It's gone to now all felony cases in this state to having uh, law enforcement leaders and a president. <coughs> Who want to take it from everyone who's arrested? There, there was just today, yeah, just today there was a judgment that uh, uh, taking a blood sample from uh, someone who was just arrested, not convicted yet, mm -hmm. was not intrusive. Yeah, and you go, sure. uh, you know, yeah. well, you know, sticking a needle in your body is not yeah. intrusive. Exactly. Well, you know, it, it's um, it's a slippery slope to. And I'm not sure what the, I'm frankly not sure what the law is in Illinois right now. Um, it's a very slippery slope to everyone is going to be required. You want a driver's license? 
give us a DNA sample. You want to apply for whatever benefits, you have to give us a DNA sample. I, I don't think that's any more outrageous to think that that could be in existence 10 years from now. And my response is I'll be damned if they're going to get it from me. Um, and I, you know, I hope my children and others feel the same way. All I can do is try to try to try to teach them. But I, I think it would be horribly, horribly wrong. Do you trust the government that in a DNA sample that they that they take from you um, won't end up in the hands of an insurance company? Well, I just wonder. What, I don't. What they're doing with the DNA? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all inmates had to have their DNA just right. All of a sudden, every inmate had to go in and. Believe yeah. me, a lot of them did not want it, and yeah. it was a problem getting it from them. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Then you have the fact that we have such a backlog of DNA in the court system mm -hmm. where crimes that are being committed, they can't get the DNA right. results of. Right. So what are they doing? Yeah, to me, it must be a money issue. Did Somebody you know? has to be getting money off of those DNA tests. We've got too much of a backlog on crimes that we're not getting the DNA for to all of a sudden make yeah. every inmate in the yeah. state of Illinois get a DNA. Yeah, you know, I, and that could well be. Usually there is a money <laughs> um, motive behind so many things. I'm not sure where it would be. I, I do know that most uh, crime labs in this country are really understaffed and under-resourced. Right. And so, you know, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't know that it would go there. I, and I, I don't know. I'm not sure how we follow well, the money Rick trail there. Scott had the, is making all that money in Florida for having the people that are mm -hmm. on uh, public aid tested for drugs because right. it's his company testing them. Right. I'm sure that's a yeah. coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask if you could speak to the role and responsibility of prosecutors that are involved in these wrongful prosecutions. That's you a know, great what, question. What some of their motivations might be. <laughs> what, yeah. <laughs> they're not, my, not cool, Lou. What their motivations might be, what kind of pressures are on them. I mean, I know in the case of the Ford Heights 4, the same prosecutor prosecuted them three times successfully, yeah. and yeah. he will never... <clears throat> He can never say that he didn't believe that they right, were guilty. Right. I mean, what kind of pressure do you think was on him from, you know, the the, the uh, district attorney that he was working for? Yeah. I believe his name was Daly. You know that. Yeah, that you know that that sort yeah. of you know that yeah. sort of external pressure onto prosecutors that they might find it hard to maintain that integrity. Or you know what? If you could just speak on that sure. relationship. I appreciate yeah, you know, um, that's a great question. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, are there any, would you have any structural reforms <laughs> to suggest with regard to prosecutors? Because obviously, like, if, if it's an elected office, and I understand why it didn't, the, you know, that looks really bad in your next election when you prosecuted someone who turns up innocent and then you tend to bulldog it to say, no, no, sure. I was right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Um, and actually, maybe I'll go to that part first, because uh, I'm over 50 and I can't remember what he said. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If only I could just get your undivided Yeah, no, I, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, North Carolina has a really interesting system. They have what they call the Innocence Commission System. Um, and the Innocence Commission System is a, um, is a panel which um, appoints um, lawyers who are not who are not an advocate for either side okay it's not a prosecutor it's not a defense attorney they are lawyers who are investigators and they go out and investigate gather the evidence both the good and the bad and present it to the Innocence Commission and the Innocence Commission then makes a decision whether or not this is an innocence case um, that, uh, that that warrants the appropriate legal documents being filed then to result in the person being free so that is one possible remedy. Um, I think there are also remedies of accountability uh, and responsibility uh, that, that the problem, you know, against any particular um, prosecutor who engages in intentional misconduct. Um, and those remedies are very, very, very difficult because of um, immunity laws. Public officials have immunity uh, for, for their misdeeds unless you can meet a very, very high standard of showing that the misdeed was 
you know, wanton and, and intentional and that sort of thing. Very hard burden to me. So um, those those are two things that immediately come to mind. This, we need to look and see, you know, should people be held a little bit more accountable? Um, a former client of mine, you may have seen this in the press in the last few days, a former client of mine, Randy Steitel, um, just got a, a $2.5 million uh, settlement award from the Illinois State Police um, because of their, uh, well, read the book, um, uh, Too Politically Sensitive by Michael Callahan, and that will describe what happened uh, in that case. Okay, back to your question. Um, there is a lot of pressure uh, on prosecutors. It certainly can come from within. Um, I think some prosecutors, though, have figured out, um, and like I said, I'm working with a couple right now. I just have the utmost respect for them because of the attitude that they take. One guy flat out said, um, I didn't prosecute this guy, so I don't know about anything about the case. I'll read about it. My assistant will read about it. And, but either way, I don't want this on my hands. If this guy's innocent and you want to do DNA testing, we'll agree, no, no problem. We'll agree to do that. And so I just have the utmost of respect for him. But he's figured out that's a good headline. That's a good headline for a guy who wants to maybe, you know, run for another, run for office again or another office. That's a great headline. Prosecutor engages in justice. That's pretty good. Um, but the problem is, two things the problem is within some offices I'm thinking of the Cruz case in particular um, that case cost um, the state's attorney the then state's attorney of DuPage County Jim Ryan that case there's an argument to made it cost him the governorship of the state because he got beat over the head with that case in the press in Chicago um, so that's what the ultimate fear is for them is oh gosh you know, if, uh, if I don't do everything I can to suppress this and to make it go away, I'm going to get beat over the head and not, and not get to, not get to um, advance my political career. And one other thing, and this is a real problem, and I don't know what the answer is to this. That is what we lawyers call the adversarial system. Um, the system is, um, you know, there's all different kinds of system, systems all over the world. China has what's called a pure truth-seeking system. Um, and what that means is that even the defense attorneys cross-examine the client, who of course does not have the right to remain silent. So that's their system. You know. okay, so, um, but here um, we have what's called the adversarial system. Prosecutor, you do your level best within the rules of ethics and the law. Mr. Defense Attorney, you do your level best with the same thing, rules within the rules of ethics and the law. And everybody else is supposed to play their role, do it straight up. And we get, we're supposed to get the just result, okay? Um, the problem is that it doesn't always work that way, obviously. But the adversarial system, and I've been in court a thousand, I wish I had a dollar for every time I thought, you know, he doesn't care. And this includes defense lawyers. He doesn't care what the truth is here. He just wants to win. He just wants to win. He doesn't care what the truth is. And that's a real problem. It's not just in criminal law. It goes into other other areas of law as well um, where um, you know how about if you represent if you got a horribly injured person and, and you represent an insurance company that's got to be hard or you represent somebody in a, a you know a child custody situation and the well, one parent who you represent not so good so that the adversarial system is really really a problem because we are trained to win in this country most people you know you know a winner we're not going to settle for losing and whether it's sports or socially or what have you and that goes right into the criminal justice so system the prosecutors probably feel that they're doing their job prosecuting people that for them not to do it to the best of their ability and ensure a guilty verdict it would be the same as a carpenter building a house in a that's right bad form yeah very good so, yeah. I, so I, I was just always curious because I, I kind of wonder where the, the prosecutors are left out in this sometimes because I can imagine it's got to be hard on some of them to have to deal with being a headline prosecutor for a wrong sure. prosecution case no that's that's a good point and I think they're also um, working in the context where I mean let me let me just again after 27 years in the criminal justice system um, I, you know I can tell you most of the people who I've represented don't have an innocence claim. You know, most of the people who I represent in my career, a large percent, you know, they're there for a reason. Um, but the question is, 
is there such a thing as what I heard one very veteran prosecutor from up around Chicago say one time, and my socks almost fell off, when he said, well, yes, sometimes innocent people are convicted, but we have what we call acceptable losses. Acceptable losses in the area of the criminal justice system. It's appalling. There are no acceptable losses. No, I'm not going to say who it was. <laughs> it's someone who, someone who came, who. It sounds like something he said. Oh, close. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> he, what those him and him mm -hmm. earlier said that if the death row stuff being executed would discourage murder, wouldn't it encourage murder? Or, like, wouldn't it not stop murder? If anything, it would encourage it because they're killing people who are murderers in a chain off. Okay. And this young guy, this, this young guy has asked the best question of the evening. And there actually are studies that show that after an execution, that the rate of violence in a particular area increases. Because what's the message? Right. It's okay to kill. That's right. Great question. You're, you're well on your way. Yes, sir. I just wanted to ask real quick earlier, you, you stressed um, uh, society's role being fear-based. Would, in your experience, do you think it would be safe to say that that is based on ignorance, to, to trace it beyond fear and say that if people were well-educated, they wouldn't be afraid? Well, that's, that, that too is a great question. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back. I'm thinking back um, over the years. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any question that, that a lot of it is is ignorance. And I, I'll, I'll cite this: um, when when prosecutors are educated are educated on um, all these different things on on uh, DNA, on false confessions, on you know, and so these are educated people, smart people. Um, and people who have very strong held beliefs to become prosecutors, um, when they're educated, they and pl and police officers, you know, th those who um, really want to listen are learning, and and I think things are, are are changing a little bit for for the better. As for other um, aspects of society, yeah, I, I don't I don't think there's any question. Our, our our experience is that the more that we educate, and I say we, I'm saying collectively. <clears throat> um, there are about 60 innocence projects in this country now, and the more, <clears throat> excuse me, the more that we educate, and the more the word gets out about exonerations and the innocence project movement, um, the more we see all kinds of folks, as I said, like prosecutors and police on the one hand, and a lot of other people uh, from other walks of life <clears throat> um, buy in to to the system. I'm not here saying. Let everybody loose. <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, are we devoted to getting it right? And we should be devoted to getting it right. So that's a great question. Education, I think, helps. Um, it's the reason that, um, that Innocence Projects try to get the word out as to what's going on. It's the reason that uh, a lot of the media has taken up writing about this to let people know what goes on. And again, I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard someone say, "Wow, I didn't know that um, you know that that there was this stuff going on. That's that's really interesting to learn." Yeah. So I think uh, you know, I th education I think is the big is the big thing. You were, talk um, you were talking about <coughs> too politically sensitive. Mm -hmm. case. Yes. Is that the one here in Illinois? Where oh yeah. The the woman was murdered, and they framed the two guys. A and woman and her husband, a newlywed couple. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. the, the, they convicted the two people, like blatantly put people on the stand that lied. And the police officer, right. is that who got the money? Um, one of the two guys who went to death row. He did. The guy. Did they get off death row? Yes, they're both they're both uh, free now. Is one right? one of them, Mr. Whitlock, uh, was a. Um, our project played a key role in exonerating him, and we're really proud of that. The last I saw of that case, I think the two men were still in prison, and no, they're both out now. They're both out. Yep. Did the police officer? Did he get his? Because they had like ruined his career, 
and he had sued. Oh, okay. Now I know which officer you're talking about. Um, the state yeah, the state police officer. And let me just say this: um, the police officer, the state police officer, was a guy who simply wanted to do his job. He was assigned this case. There was a lot of questions and unknowns and you know reinvestigation that needed to be done. It was sent to Mike Callahan. Mike Callahan um, <coughs> was a you know was a cop's cop. He you know you know, the concept of oh they're wrongfully convicted and I you know and I want to you know clear their name. No, that's not what he's doing. He was a cop's cop. He wanted to f take the case where the evidence led and find out who did it. And that's it. <coughs> um, and what the Illinois State Police, uh, uh, certain members of the Illinois State Police did to him is explained in the book, and you should read the book. That's and that, that is that case. That's exactly that's, right. That's the, this is the cops. Yes. And, he, and the, to answer your question, he won a judgment in, uh, in federal court. The case went up on appeal to the federal appellate court, and <clears throat> that court threw out the judgment. So he got nothing. He got nothing. And it's done. He can't go any further. He's, he's done in that respect. That's right. By, by his book, everybody, and maybe that'll help him out. Yeah, no, it's a good it. book. <laughs> yeah, it's a good book. <laughs> now I'm going to have to. Yeah, it's a wonderful book, and Mike is, Mike is a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful guy. was a really, a really, <coughs> really good police officer, and, uh, and really, uh, uh, you know, just read the book, and you'll get it. Yeah, don't don't say, rely on what I say. Read the book. Did he, get a, did he get a career? I mean, is his career... He's retired from ISP. He's retired. Yeah. So, wow. So, and then I gotta go. Oh, I'm, I'm just that. dead. Yeah. What were you saying? What were you saying? Yeah, you the, the prosecutor, the prosecutor yeah. saying acceptable losses. I'm reminded of more than one case in which someone was innocently convicted and put on death row. And meanwhile, the perpetrators out there. Great point. Yeah, great um, point. So we Dugan continue. in the in Dugan the, in the Nicaragua cruise case. Yeah, right. exactly. That's a great, great point. And what's sad is that there was some evidence that you know this is we're talking about the Cruz uh, Hernandez case, a case that I was involved in many years ago. And what we learned uh, over the years was that there, um, as they were pushing this toward Rolando and Alex because they believed that it was um, a, a gang of a so-called gang of, of Latin burglars that went in and decided, oh, we're not going to burglarize anything. We're going to take the take the little girl instead, which is their silly theory from the beginning. Um, it, it, that while they were pursuing that theory, there were some people in the department that wanted to pursue the guy who we know later, 20 years later, really did it. But they didn't because this was their theory. They were running with it. And what did that guy do? While they while they decided or when they decided not to go after him, Brian Dugan, what did he do? Two, one little girl and one 27 year old nurse. And how sad is that? So your point is is well taken. Um, yeah, let's get the right guy for a lot of reasons. That's the whole point. So I really thank you. If you have any other questions, uh, you know, uh, ask now. Uh, otherwise, I gotta go. Thank you. You get the number one question award. Yeah. <laughs>